Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to those of you in Europe and good evening to all of you in Southeast Asia. Welcome to our special Cambodia seminar series. This series is a collaboration between the Center for Khmer Studies, the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University, and the uh, New York Southeast Asia Network together these uh, we are hosting this special program today and we are delighted to have as our guest here today Magalie Berton who's going to be speaking to you about her work on uh, Cambodian silks and textiles as they as uh, they connect to the National Museum of, in Cambodia. The title of her talk today is called The Making and Unmaking of the National Museum of Cambodia's Textile Collection. And before I introduce uh, Magalie, I'd just like to, to go over a few housekeeping matters um, before we get started. So our program today is being recorded um, and it will last one hour and we will begin with um, my introduction to Magalie and then she'll give a, a, a presentation and we'll follow this with, with questions. Um, so you will all have a, a chance to um, ask questions uh, to our speaker. We request, however, that you do not put your questions into the chat. Um, instead, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please put the questions um, in there and we will do our best to uh, address them all as they come up. Um, so that's, that's basically the plan. So let me go ahead and introduce our special guest today, uh, Magalie Berton. Uh, Magalie, we're so delighted that you're here. Um, Magalie you. is a textile historian and she's currently a postdoc fellow um, in the humanities uh, at the Center for Textile Research at the University of Copenhagen. She received her PhD uh, in history of design at the Royal University of London. And she also holds a um, MFA in textile design and she's worked um, in the fashion textile design industry for a number of years and also has wor worked for a while as a uh, documentary maker and journalist. So uh, she has a really fascinating background and has worked in, in several, several, part, several continents already. And um, so we are delighted to have her here. So Magali, um, would you like to, to begin? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, without further ado, because I know we have a short amount of time, so I'm hoping to share as much as I can about this project, this research project, and have some space for some questions. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, is that good? Do you guys see it? Okay, perfect. So, um, close a few windows distracting and I'm ready to go so yeah so it's really my pleasure to be here um my presentation is going to uh carry the title that I, um Eve has said has mentioned the making and unmaking of the textile collection at the National Museum of Cambodia uh looking especially at uh its history uh, in the 70s, uh, since the from the late 1960s to the uh, 1980s, uh, the early 1980s, with a focus on the uh, Khmer Rouge regime specifically in the aftermath of that period. So, um, so I'm, I'm just going to start. Uh, in Cambodia, silk is a highly valued resource that has involved diverse political agendas, both externally and internally which is also reflected in the formation of the textile collection at the National Museum of Cambodia, uh, the main national institution for textile artifacts in the country. So today I'm presenting uh, one key study of Tex Khmer Rouge, uh, which is the title from my Horizon 2020 Marie Curie Fellowship uh, project at the Center of Textile Studies, uh, Center of Textile Research at the University of Copenhagen. And this focus is uh, a part of the project on textile production, artifacts, and dress practices in Cambodia from the 1970s, as I mentioned, to the early 1980s, uh, especially under uh, the Khmer Rouge regime. So uh, my interest lies in tracing the formation of the National Museum's textile collection and charting its tra trajectory through the 20th century, how it was formed under the French protectorate, uh, to the late 1960s and how it was affected during and after the year of conflict 
uh, civil war and dictatorship. Uh, the content of this collection and its consequent loss in the late 1970s demand uh, particular attention. This study highlights the monetary and collectible value of Cambodian silks, but also their value as cultural heritage and repository of skills and knowledge. The loss is reconsidered as a byproduct of the Khmer Rouge regime to embody uh, in a material way, this traumatic period of human, cultural, and artistic destruction. So this is a, a little timeline that I put together um, about uh, from the formation of the museum from 1920, the creation of the museum in 1920, uh, to its closing in 1975, its reopening in 1979, and uh, further um, stages uh, by the 1990s. Uh, and in the lower uh, part, I'm adding the names of the different directors that have been um, essential in uh, making this, this museum uh, alive and active. So um, the National Museum was originally named Musée Albert Saro after the then Governor General of uh, Indochina. Um, the building was inaugurated in 1920 in Phnom Penh. Uh, born in Cambodia and educated in France, uh, Georges Groulier, that you can see here on the left, was a French artist, architect, and educator. And he was commissioned by the general uh, Governor General Albert Saro to establish a program for the arts destined to Cambodian populations. So uh, Groulier transformed the Royal Palace workshops into a school to promote Cambodian crafts and combined it uh, to, uh, with a museum that you can see here uh, on the right. Um, I'm going quickly of, over that uh, history. And so he created a school, the School of Cambodian Arts, uh, with six workshops, drawing and architecture, sculpture, woodworking and gold plating, foundry, silverware and weaving. A Cambodian master craftsman was in charge of each workshop uh, with only Cambodian apprentices. And here you have an image of that uh, weaving workshop. Uh, there were about 25 young female weavers who worked there uh, on, the, on a weekly, daily basis. Um, and so at the time, uh, the Samput Hol, uh, Samput means uh, hip wrap and Hol means ikat in Khmer, um, was quite popular. And it was popular within Cambodian people uh, first and foremost. And so the Samput Hol, uh, and this is an example actually of a pidan, but I'll explain that in a minute. So the Samput Hol is a rectangular piece of cloth that was worn as a hip wrapper to attend religious ceremonies and weddings and woven in the traditional technique of polychromic ikat silk. Um, this technique means that it's um, basically you tie and dye the weft threads with different baths of uh, dyes and colors to obtain uh, at the end uh, a pattern on the surface of the cloth put into the loom. Um, and in the 1920s, under the French protectorate, this type of textiles also became a commodity, especially for the French. And here you have um, some of those textiles in the Pidan style, which is uh, a pictorial hanging representing some seeds of the Buddha, life of the Buddha. And those were made by women and put in temples as, as gifts and donations. Um, so you have an example here of a Pidan style textile that was produced uh, by weavers uh, at the School of Cambodian Arts uh, and the Service of the Arts and uh, for a French uh, house of silk textiles. And this was featured in Vogue magazine, the French Vogue from 1927. Uh, Grolier considered tourists as a quote, a rich client base avid of exoticism and always ready to acquire souvenirs and testimonials of faraway countries that they visited, unquote. So uh, as a result, he also used this whole structure, the School of Cambodian Arts, the museum, into a, a commercial outlet. Uh, in 1924, he founded Les Corporations Cambodiennes, the Cambodian corporations, which gathered up to 200 uh, craftspeople, and they would produce for the export market via the colonial sales. And this uh, service was called Les Services des Arts, the service of the arts. Um, and from that service, about 3,000 silk samput were ordered between 1921 and 1925. Um, I'll get to that in a minute, but there are no uh, examples of such objects that were kept in collections post 
Khmer Rouge regime. So I'm showing here an example of something that looks, I think, similar to what may have been produced at the time. So this piece is um, a sampled hole in the style that I was describing, those polychromic ECATs uh, with um, weft uh, ECAT patterns. Uh, but this one is actually a bit shorter than the original size of the sampled hole. And those were made for the French market, for the export market, and to be worn as shawls or decorative objects, uh, and not worn as hip wraps, uh, the way Cambodian women would at the time. Uh, this object in this case is held at the Quai Branly Museum in Paris and originated from the Ministry of France Overseas Information Documentation Service, which is basically, which was the former ministry of uh, the colonies. Um, and to go back to the making of the museum's textile collection. Until 1976, uh, the National Museum was led by French keepers uh, who progressively gathered an important collection of Cambodian antiquities, stone, metal, wood, and ceramics mostly, from the Angkor and pre Angkorian periods. Um, but they also acquired textiles, and some of which would come from Le Service des Arts, uh, that commercial uh, endeavor uh, at the, at the uh, institution. Uh, in the earlier version of the cataloging system, textiles and clothing were registered on paper cards and carried the letter N, as shown here in this general catalog dating from 1924 uh, from the museum archives. And you can see here on the right, in written in French, all those numbers N47, N48, with a short description, the material, and the size also of uh, the objects. Uh, in addition to textiles, um, weaving tools dating from the School of Cambodian Arts in the 1920s were also collected, most likely by Georges Gaulier, uh, to document silk weaving processes in the manner of an early ethnographic museum. So you have examples here, uh, photographed in 1923 as part of the museum archives, but also those objects are still in the collection, have remained in the collection. Uh, to the present day and have been incorporated, for example, in uh, Gill and Green's book on uh, traditional textiles. And then moving a bit uh, in history and looking a bit at, the, at this timeline of acquisition inventory pre-1980 uh, and looking at different museum uh, directors uh, who uh, worked uh, in the museum, at the museum. So in this timeline of museum directors and curators, successive ways of cataloging are shown. Georges Goulier himself cataloged the collection, followed by the active contributions of Jean Boisselier, Solange Thierry, and Madeleine Gito in terms of cataloging and collection management. Uh, Boisselier directly reused the information from Grolier files on new cards. No photographs were attached to these records. Uh, while a small number of 18th century ceremonial brocades came from the former royal capital of Udang, the bulk of the textile collection was acquired between 1918 and 1951, reaching the number of approximately 399 textile artifacts and elements of dance costumes. So here you have um, the chronology and the timeline of uh, the different directors and, and what happened. Um, in here, an example of those cards uh, by Georges Grolier first. So this 1927 record written in French features a short description of the object that you can see here on the left. At the top of the card is also penciled an indication of where the object was housed. Uh, in this case, the window casing of the musical uh, instruments display. And on the right, uh, this is the back of the card. You can see dates of inventory check-in and they ran from 1944 to 1966, which supposedly this is the last time this object and this record was checked uh, um, until the museum closed. Uh, there are also other archival documents uh, available uh, and this one, and they show the display of specific textiles in permanent galleries, uh, such as this window casing that was dedicated to Royal Treasury gifts. So uh, the museum's North Gallery was dedicated to decorative and applied arts, including wood carving, lacquer, ceramics, metalwork and textiles. And you can see here on the diagram on the left, uh, you have those N numbers at the center and even the inscription, some put hole, 
which means uh, ECAT hip wrap. Uh, and those are um, referring to specific objects that would be showcased uh, in this uh, window casing that you can also see on uh, this image on the right. And then here, uh, continuing, uh, this is one of the final cards from the registry that was dedicated to textiles. And uh, it was prepared in 1962 by Madeleine Gitto. Uh, for a silk scarf donated by the Mongolian delegation at the sixth conference of the International Buddhist Association in 1961. Um, the written description uh, may imply this gift was a ceremonial fringe silk scarf that we call Kadag. Um, objects also traveled for international loans. For instance, in 1963, a group of 21 textiles, costumes, masks, and headdresses uh, travel to Japan as part of an exhibition on Khmer art at the Matsuza Kaya department store in Tokyo. So you have a description and a translation here of that description in English. And then uh, looking at what happened uh, towards the late, late 60s uh, and 70s. So in 1966, Cambodian art historian Chia Te Seng was appointed as the first Cambodian director of the museum while also serving as Dean of the new Faculty of Archaeology at the Royal University of Fine Arts of Phnom Penh. Consequently named Inspector General of Cultural Heritage in 1974, he was then replaced at the museum by Li Vu Ong. Unfortunately, when the country collapsed in 1975, both men were imprisoned and executed at S21 prison in 1976. Uh, in 1975, Phnom Penh, January 1975, Phnom Penh was completely evacuated by civilians, and therefore the museum was closed and abandoned until 1979. Um, the museum reopened to the public on April 13, 1979, with its collections in derelict. Most of the, the pre-1975 staff had died, resulting in a significant loss of knowledge about the museum's history and objects. The museum only recovered 72 flat textiles in a costume collection of between 30 to 40 pieces, mostly accessories for Cambodian dance, belts, necklaces, hairpieces to embroidered fans, and theater costumes, such as shirts, trousers, and shoulder pads. Haptuk, a uh, former director, deputy director in the 2000s, formed the hypothesis that two thirds of this collection had disappeared upon the reopening, not during until it closed, not until 1979, but upon reopening, due to main reasons. First, environmental factors such as floods in the storage uh, in the museum basement during the rainy seasons. And second, which is mostly probably the biggest reason of this loss, uh, the objects were stolen and resold abroad in the years following the museum reopening. Uh, you have here not a lot of uh, images, but one image of a conservator, uh, Catherine Milliken, Australian conservator, who was there on site to help um, put the museum back together. Uh, this is in uh, 1993. Um, so what is left from the original pre-conflict collection consists mostly of multicolored Kiet Plongi headscarves made by Cham Malay ethnic groups, and only two Khmer Sampot Hol and one Pidan, according to Mrs. Kunti Rikong, who's in charge of the collection now. Uh, there are also five ceremonial Sampot dating from the 1910s, and such as this brittle object uh, here. Uh, and there's also um, the Sampot Chorbap, uh, which is a red brocaded, brocaded silk with supplementary weft gold um, metallic threads. Uh, they is kept folded in storage box uh, due to its condition. So just a few objects here. You have here uh, a very fragile Sampot hole uh, that is in two-tone, in ikat in two-tone, a really brittle silk. And this uh, Chorbap, which is a brocade in gold thread and silk on this uh, rust uh, orange ground. Um, images of objects also that are accessible now on the museum uh, database that I'm going to mention in a few. Um, they are really old objects, most likely the ones donated uh, from the capital of Udon. And then uh, the Kiet textiles that I mentioned, also the Cham Malay uh, 
uh, tie-dye textiles are not woven per se. The motifs are obtained through tie-dye techniques. Uh, that is quite of a, an important collection now uh, from this pre-1975 uh, collection. So the scarcity of silk textiles in post-conflict Cambodia um, in public and private collections has significantly diminished the available knowledge of styles and motifs that can be drawn directly from historic artifacts, which also leads to look at uh, collections held in, sometimes in Western countries. The collection in this case was partially photographed by French anthropologist Bernard Dupin in the late 1960s, which could potentially be matched to museum records. Um, reshifting the focus, not only on what has remained in the collection, but on what has disappeared, open up uh, ways to materialize and acknowledge uh, the rich diversity of textile craftsmanship pre-1970 and acknowledge further the wasteful, destructive nature of the Khmer Rouge regime and civil war. For instance, it is important to note that most silk ikat pieces, some put hole and ho pidan, disappeared, where, while ethnic Chan textiles remain in the collection, which speaks to enduring value of silk ikat as commodities and uh, currency of exchange right after the dictatorship, and likely the lack of interest in more vernacular artifacts that were not considered mainstream Khmer. So I put together this diagram, which is still work in progress. Uh, these are estimates on the collection, the, probably some numbers that can be shifted a bit, but overall it gives you an understanding of what is missing. Um, and this is something I'm interested in. It's not just looking at what is left, but also materializing in some ways, even through diagrams, um, the part that is no longer there. And for this research project, really focus almost more on what was uh, lost to get a, a clear understanding of, of this uh, collection. So uh, since the 1980s, there have been multiple agents uh, involved in maintaining the textile collection uh, with people coming from the US, Japan, France, and Australia. The collection inventory project uh, ran for six years from 2004 to 2010, and it was funded by the Leon Levy Foundation in collaboration with the Center for My Studies to locate and document the museum's 14,000 objects in 11 categories, especially those stores in the basement. The project made sense of all the existing registration methods used by the museum since its foundation, including the several French card catalog systems that I mentioned, Khmer handwritten history uh, inventory lists, and pre-existing databases. Um, since the early uh, to 2017, uh, the pre-1970 collection has been completed with diverse donations uh, from international experts and organizations. And, and now since 2017 currently counts about 245 pieces. These objects have been kept in climate controlled uh, storage room on the museum's second floor. And they've been fully inventoried under the care of uh, Mrs. Kung uh, Kuntiri. Australian textile expert Galen Green donated uh, 80 whole pieces and four pidan in 2009, followed by two more sampo chorba uh, in 2010. In 2011, the nonprofit organization Caring for Young Khmer, uh, which is uh, Japanese funded um, and trains weavers in Takeo province to master the art of pidan, also donated 27 pieces, some of which reproduced lost objects from the museum based on photographs. The donation was followed by an special exhibition entitled Revitalizing Khmer Treasure, Pidan Pictorial Eco Silk in 19, uh, 2014, sorry. The museum uh, allocated uh, a limited space to access silk related artifacts in the permanent galleries, uh, exhibiting a carved loom that you can see on the right, tools as well, two modern pidan hangings uh, originally donated by the center uh, caring for young Khmer and one brocaded silk. In 2018, a display of Khmer classical ballet objects dating from the 1920s, 1930s Sisovat era uh, was added, featuring embroidered elements of a male costume and an embroidered sabai, a sash uh, for dance, as part of a collaboration between the museum and researchers from L'Ecole Française d'Extrême-Orient, uh, the, uh, the French School of Far East uh, Studies. So to conclude, uh, 
The theoretical and conceptual decision to recenter on the absent objects offers an avenue of possibilities, some of which have been briefly presented today. Um, through continuous methodical historical reconstruction, there is more to find in the near future to gather further knowledge about these missing pieces and pursue the humble task of making something out of loss. Uh, the registry records, um, I consider them as textual sources that materialize the missing objects, embodying their absence and acting as placeholders. Uh, a little bit like the meta metadata of a digital picture that would have been erased uh, to signify the presence, the existence of these objects. Um, this, project's, this project here argues that in uh, addition to uh, looking at what was found and added, a closer look at material heritage uh, loss contributes to uh, an agenda for cultural reconstruction and restoration. Yes, thank you, Magali. That was absolutely fascinating. And, and um, I'm sure the audience has lots of questions. But before we get started with that, I'd like to ask you some questions myself um, sure. as, as moderator. Um, one of the things that really fascinates me about your talk is this, you talk about loss and the loss of this cultural heritage and, and, and memory that goes with it. Um, but you also talk about these um, cards, these, these physical um, remnants of, of that, that hold traces of that past. They, they, they show that something was there, that something now that is absent from there. And um, I find that, that, really very interesting because those cards themselves hold memory and especially because um, you know there's these different inventories that are marked for different times that show the revisiting and the sort of represence in a way um, of those um, textiles that were lost um, this accounting for this history that's contained on these cards and um, so in many ways, I think those represent so much meaning themselves that, that you know, somebody actually, you know, there's a tangible memory there, someone writing on those cards that the textiles were there. And I was wondering if you could relate that at all to the sort of tangible history of the textiles themselves and their meanings as from the person that made them to the person, you know, to, of how they might have been worn to the, you know, that tactile memory, and then as in their journey to the museum. Well, yeah, thank you for, for this question. Uh, yeah, I think it's um, when I first encountered those cards, I was quite, uh, you know, it's easy to dismiss them because the object is no longer there. So there's a sense that, oh, these are just, you know, telling you that they existed, but we don't. But I, I thought they were um, containing so much information and they contain information almost as in the idea that the object that they were discussing or they were caring for because curating is the idea of care right as just taking care of the objects and putting them in a place and caring for them uh, that they were uh, selected by a curator uh, in the, this first card that I've uh, shown it's 1927 so it's mostly Georges Grolier and you know he spent time collecting objects but also collecting things from the service des arts uh, and and you know trying to he had this vision about Cambodian crafts, which is specific to, let's say, maybe a French colonial mindset, but he also had true passion, I think, for, for Cambodian crafts. Um, and so he, for some reason, selected those objects and put them in the collection. And the act of like writing the cards um, and paying care or putting this, these objects in a specific place, I think was interesting to me. Um, and then me eventually maybe also showcasing them in the museum, displacing them, uh, placing them, displaying them, sorry, uh, in the galleries. So I like the idea that they're showing a movement in a way that, you know, sometimes we tend to treat uh, objects or records as dead artifacts in some ways. And to me, they're really interesting uh, because they're showing the movement of from, you know, maybe the school of Cambodian arts or, uh, the workshops that were more for commercial purposes than to the collection, than maybe to display, maybe stored in a specific place, um, and then cared for successively by those waves of uh, curators and directors, because all of them revisit those cards with those notes that you see at the back. I think that was really interesting to me. They revisited, rechecked, replaced, and, and cared for through that time. 
not just taken, put somewhere and then forgotten about. Yes. So, um, and, you know, from 1975 to 1979, it's only, only four years. So it's, we tend to think of the museum's history, especially the colonial history, uh, as separated, the museum as a colonial object and also existing up to the 1970s, a separate object from, let's say, the what happened in the 70s and the, the dictatorship, the Khmer Rouge regime. But it's only four years. So the practices that those objects were communicating um, were very much still existing in 1975. And, and people in 1979 still remember them. Uh, they didn't forget in that time. So those cards I find are, have a, a larger value than just being, you know, flat paper records for sure. And I guess on top of that, there's the the writing, the handwriting, I think that adds to this humanity and giving back a sense. And then I could go on, on, on you know, other theories about text and textiles, which is, you know, from the same uh, theory of, of idea of the, that textiles is also the word, and that's been kind of a, a theoretical idea that's been traveling for, for, for centuries in most many cultures, the textual quality of textiles as writing history, writing culture. Well, that's that's so interesting, and I do think that the <laughs> what you were just talking about the text and the textile is such an important component, especially when you're talking about a particular history and those textiles carrying that history, and then those cards carrying those history, and then you know still obviously some textiles are still around. Um, so that's actually a very fascinating aspect. Um, I, you know, I wanted to ask you a little bit, um, a, a couple more questions on the textiles themselves about um, the selection of textiles as they ended up in the museum. For um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the collect, like how they were chosen and why, um, and and was there any particular um, uh, textile producers, any particular weavers that, that were drawn on perhaps more than others? Um, and, yeah. and are any of those still in, in the museum today? Well, that's, um, there's a lot still to uncover uh, on those records. Um, from the time I've spent, I mean, you can see there's a majority uh, of those objects that are no longer, that were lost. Uh, there were silks, uh, um, almost all of them were silk textile. So that's also a choice because cotton also exist, uh, existed in Cambodia and people would produce cotton textiles. But most of it was uh, silk. Um, and then most of those objects also were in the uh, ECAT technique, uh, the, that technique of tie dye on the thread um, in the weft ECAT technique that's specific to Cambodian textiles. Um, because there are other techniques that have been you know, existing in Cambodian textiles, like the brocaded, uh, with gold thread that I mentioned for dance and ceremonial purposes as well. Those are existing, were existing, but the big focus I think was on, on uh, ECAT textiles. So I don't have an, a full explanation of that. Uh, I know that because what I was mentioning that it was a trend also among uh, the exotic, an exotic trend in a way as a commodity for French uh, um, tourists and French uh, buyers um, during the French protectorate. So it's difficult to know if it was a trend because uh, that's the main, the bulk of what was being produced at the time, or uh, did they collect a lot of those because they loved them and they were producing them and selling them or they were commodities. It's a bit di difficult to know which one is which one. Is it because the craftsmanship was so good that it convinced a lot of people to buy them, collect them and put them in collections? Or was it because... Uh, for some reason, uh, French people in colonial, uh, French and others uh, in Europe had uh, a taste for those and then increased the production um, in, in that way and it ended up in the museum. So that's a bit un unclear to me so far. But um, I would say that um, they are, I mean, Pidan textiles were also heavily um, uh, collected. And those pidan are quite rare, even as a practice. It was something that was more uh, specific to the south of Cambodia in Takeo province. And it's not something that people would sell necessarily. Uh, those uh, They would make them as collective work to donate them to Buddhist temples. And um, so those also were heavily collected um, as well. So um, 
I think the input was on, you know, beautiful examples of this, these two techniques, both with ECAT, one with pictorial and one with uh, more the geometric motifs uh, that were typical. Uh, but there are more things to, uh, you know, unfold for sure. And I was interested in that final card, you know, from Madeleine Gito, the fact that they would at some point move on and also accept gifts, incorporate them in the museum. And they're also a token of the history that happened at the time, talking about that Buddhist uh, uh, congregation, for example. So maybe, uh, you know, there's more time to be spent. Obviously, it's the beginning of the project. I have a bit more time to do that with my Marie Curie Fellowship. Uh, but there is more to kind of dig into the curator's archives and Madeleine Gito also donated her, her archives so we can kind of see if there are some traces of information. Even though we'd say that most of the interest of all those keepers has never exactly been textiles. It was mostly uh, uh, antiquities, archaeological works above uh, those more ethnographic objects. Great, thanks. So there, there's a question in the chat that, can, that goes back to the cards. Um, um, so uh, this is from Jenny. Do the cards provide enough information to create categories of textiles, um, such as a some put hole it's, and um, oh, the some put be done? Oh, yeah. Um, in regard yeah. to the specific uh Mostly. Yeah, yeah, they do. They do. They don't give a lot of information. And it's like you, if you remember the, the catalog is, you know, a few lines about each object. Uh, they do say if it's a pidan or a some pothole. So at least we can see that. And then there's the size, which is also good information. If it's a some pothole chong, chong kaben, meaning a longer piece that is worn wrapped as a as a pair of wrapped trousers or some put some loy. Uh, uh, style, which is, you know, smaller hip wrap that is worn by women uh, in more uh, common ways. So you can have information about that. In terms of the motifs, it's another, it's a bigger problem. Descriptions are very uh, succinct and uh, a bit broad. Uh, you can see that it doesn't go in details about, uh, you know, uh, iconography of motifs. It's mostly saying uh, there's a band, a stripe, uh, a red ground, a purple ground, and descriptions of colors, and um, geometrics is a term that comes up the most, which is a bit frustrating for me um, in the idea that I would try to match up the, the, the photography uh, uh, images with um, that are left from uh, Bernard Dupin's uh, photographs from 1960 to the records. It's going to be a bit tricky for me to be able to connect them. But it's, you know, a task I'm interested in trying to do uh, in some ways. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to bring up the, this. Um, I have a couple other questions myself, but I'd like to first um, turn to um, Helen's question here. Um, she says, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, could you revisit the names of the two curators who perished in S21? Did they leave any information in the so-called confessions of other biographical documents? Or did you have any further information about them? Also, a big thank you to the, to the donors for the textiles um, uh, helping to rebuild this precious collection. This comes from Helen Jarvis. Yeah, I mean, I've, it's been interesting to me because I'm really focusing on the 1970s, 1980s, and I'm not mentioning this today, but the other side of the coin of my research is really going uh, at S21, the Tulsang Genocide Museum, and look into uh, their records, but also their uh, garment and textile collection. So it's it, it's almost as if I'm, I'm thinking of these two sites, the National Museum and Tulsang, as two sides of the, of the same coin, two sides of the same uh, perspective of giving material uh, evidence and material interest in the Khmer, Khmer Rouge genocide of uh, that time period. But uh, to go back to your question, so the two uh, curators, uh, the first one is uh, Chia Tai Seng, um, and he was an art historian, and uh, the second one was Li Wu Ong, and Li Wu Ong didn't stay for a very long time. And uh, Chia Tai Seng, I think during that time, there was a big uh, renovation prop program in the museum. So I don't know how much acquisition has been happening. Um, I did discuss that with uh, someone at, 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 um, at, at TSMG, at GM, the Tulsang uh, Genocide Museum. 
um, they just found their names. I think there are no uh, confessions uh, available on on these people, but I'm interested in doing more research to kind of uh, find more information for sure. Um, I think it was found that they both were taken and died in 1976, but um, I don't know much much more about that. What I'm hoping is to, uh, when I go back to Cambodia, do more research, at least in the archives from the National Museum, to see their actions uh, as uh, directors, and then try to see if there's anything that I can come up with from, from uh, the Tulsang uh, Genocide Museum. But so far, not much has been found about their their lives or biographical documents that could have been produced uh, um, at S21. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have a question um, regarding the, the, the loss of the um, textiles from the museum um, in the aftermath of the Khmer Rouge. You said that many of them were stolen and, and it also some of them were destroyed by, um, they disintegrated and so forth from the conditions that they were in. However, the, um, and but those that were lost were mostly the Khmer um, Sotpidan and, and, and whole and so forth. Um, at the same time, you said that, that the other textiles like the Chan Kiet um, remain still. I, and I, did, did the, the ones, is there any way to know uh, which ones were, were how many were actually stolen versus um, disintegrated from the conditions they were in? And is there some reason why those would have, would have um, deteriorated and, and the Chiam Kiet, are they different? Um, they did not. Did, um, right. Yeah, yeah, I understand where you're, uh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know yet about that. I think that's a really good question about why. Uh, I think, um, well, in terms of the deterioration, I think a lot of those textiles and objects were kept in the storage. And because the museum was closed, uh, there was no you know, housekeeping or anything. So when there were floods with the rainy season, then the collection uh, started to, to get you know, humidity and humidity is really the worst, uh, textiles worst enemy basically. And so um, the deterioration I think was pretty uh, uh, big in that, in that time. Um, but uh, I'm not sure about that. I think it would be uh, one of the uh, avenues right now, because I'm trying to find ways to find more information, would be to try maybe to uh, discuss with uh, museum staff if there are still some people that would be interested in talking from 1980 and see what was going on in terms of, uh, you know, the Cons con conservation, but also uh, like the emergency conservation uh, decisions that were being made about how to salvage uh, the collection and kind of keep it uh, in good shape. And that would allow me to know how many objects were actually discarded or let go or lost because of that um, uh, environment, those environmental environmental reasons. But I think um, from what Haptouche has says, uh, really mostly it was mostly disappeared. So difficult to say if it was stolen exactly or disappeared or taken or, I mean, disappeared, I think is probably the easiest word. And also the question of where did they go, right? Uh, and can we find them? That was also the question. But if there aren't a lot of photographs of those objects and just those paper records, uh, it's difficult to identify and even find them. Uh, anywhere at collectors or in museum collections. But I think silk was a commodity. It was, uh, a, you know, an important uh, material, had value. And in times of hardship, uh, having silks would, uh, you know, be bartered or traded against uh, for, for money, uh, not money, for, for food or for supplies or for things or things like that. So it makes sense that these would have been... Um, you know, for survival reasons, uh, an attractive object to take and easy also to steal it. Textiles are portable objects, so it's easy to steal them, easy to um, move them. Uh, and without, you know, uh, it's, it's more discreet than a statue, obviously, even though there was also some looting in that department. Um, so, um, yeah, that's a good question. I haven't, I haven't had the answer yet about the proportion between loss and, uh, and deterioration, I think really the, the stealing is, or the looting is, is much more consequent. And yes, there's a question of why the kit, the cham kit were 
still there. And I'm sure there's still some of those were textiles maybe were lost or in bad condition, uh, but overall not looted, not stolen because maybe uh, consider of less value. And it's interesting to think about how the value also shifts from a colonial collection to uh, a national collection and to a post-conflict collection. What is the value of those objects and who decides of that? Thank you. Um, so there's several questions now that have come in. Um, so uh, we have, uh, let's see, about 15 minutes left. So we'll try to yeah. get to all of them. So. Question from Eric. Um, how has the project and agenda of preserving and displaying Cambodian textiles at the museum changed as we move from a pre and post Khmer eras? Well, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I touched upon that a little bit uh, through all the really, I mean, that's what Helen Jarvis was saying, the incredible, I think, volunteer work and effort from um, the Cambodian people, Cambodian and the museum, who really tried to reopen the museum really early in 1979, was back on, and they tried to salvage what was in there, and also some international support as well to uh, rebuild, reframe, support, conserve. So there has been, a, I think, a much stronger uh, effort in the past, you know, since the 1990s to, to the present day. Um, so in terms of displaying, I think it's still pretty, it's still a bit shy. I'm hoping I'm preaching for my choir and I'm hoping that, you know, through works like this, through conversations, uh, we can bring more interest in uh, Cambodian textiles within museum worlds as well, uh, Cambodian museum institutions as well. But I would say that uh, there has been tremendous effort in conservation uh, all those years to what I was saying, you know, to catalog everything, inventory everything, but also to put them in storage on the second floor where there is no risk of uh, floods, for example. And that has been a big, a uh, uh, lot of work. And, you know, some, a lot of training as well from, from uh, textile conservators uh, from different places in the world who came and also tried to train. There's the idea of really uh, giving um, support uh, and um, making this collection sustainable and continue and expand which I'm hoping I, I can contribute to, to some uh, humble ways. Yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, so um, Emily asks here, uh, what's it just disappeared on my screen? Um, let me see here, oops, sorry about that. Um, thank you for this wonderful discussion. Could you tell us more about the changing uh, farming challenges for uh, yeah. textile production and also could you tell us more about the pictorial what kind of pictorial images are depicted on the textiles yeah i mean for the during the um, i mean farming challenges uh yeah it's it's a real it's a real topic it was mostly the topic of my phd so it's something I'm, I'm, i've been looking at a lot i'm trying right now to look more into the the Khmer rouge time and see what textile production meant at the time and, and the uh, disruption of uh, that textile production and farming challenges. Uh, but so, I mean, it's a long discussion. Maybe I don't have enough time to go into that. But I would say uh, during the Khmer Rouge, uh, farming um, and silk production, in this case of silk, uh, was uh, were both heavily disrupted because you know of displacements of farmers and weavers, uh, forced put to forced work, having to flee, move to other places, um, and all the other hardship that that you know they had to encounter. So the uh, current the textile production at the time, the artisanal one of quality products. Uh, was uh, appended for sure, um, with more focus on cotton production, mass production also, to be able to clothe the population. But even so, in the Khmer Rouge uh, regime, there was a lot of uh, imports from China, for example, and other and factories uh, as well. And in terms of silk, silk was mostly forbidden uh, to be worn. It was a sign of luxury. It was not favored. It was something that they did not uh, um, support, except for uh, diplomatic events where silk was still allowed, where you could still, uh, officials, Khmer Rouge officials and cutters could still wear in some cases. Uh, in terms of current fa challenges, I mean, my research stops in 2018 for my PhD. So I'm sure COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic has added a whole enormous amount of challenges right now. Uh, but in the 90s, 
to the present, there has been a tremendous effort also in relaunching the production, um, mostly with imported silk yarn, though, from China and Vietnam. Not a lot of local indigenous uh, Cambodian golden silk is being produced uh, to the present day. And about the Pidan uh, textiles, in the case of Pidan, the imagery is mostly Buddhist uh, inspired. So the tales of the life of the Buddha, like um, the Jat Jatakase uh, uh, tales and uh, um, and stories like that. And on the other, like Samputol, it's mostly textiles of, you know, showing uh, stylized flowers, uh, geometrics, naga, uh, nak, uh, snake uh, animals, and some birds as well. But mostly geometric motifs. It was very much of a almost optic art kind of uh, production through those ecats. It's creating a lot of uh, through all those colors and those uh, effects, kind of a visual striking, uh, uh, I think, effect on, on the people who would wear them and people who would see women wearing those silks. Um, but yeah, it's it's a long conversation, I guess, uh, to get into. So um, yeah, several more questions here. So I, I think since you're just talking about the silks themselves, let's stay on that topic for um a moment question about uh, asking about um, where good collections of Cambodian uh, pedans can be found outside of IKTT in, in Siem Reap. Uh, yeah, and then there's yeah. another question, which maybe we can put with that one um, regarding the Samput. I, I'm not familiar with this myself. Jala book Kabai. I don't know if you've heard of that type uh, of uh, Samput. Um, um, whether there's attempt to re recreate create a replica of some type of silk. Yeah, um, I don't I don't know exactly what the cello book might looks like. Uh, sometimes my my terminology is not always uh, the same, so I'm not sure of that. But so I cannot really answer to that question. But I would be interested in seeing what it looks like, and then I would probably know what what I, it looks like, or maybe someone else in the audience knows. Uh, for IKTT and the Pidan, yeah, I mean CYK caring for Yang Mai. Uh, they are also uh, producing those and supporting weavers um, in learning. And they're the ones who donated to the National Museum. Uh, they were also with natural dyes to some extent, but IKTT works more strongly with natural dyes. There's not a lot of other uh, organizations. Uh, Artisan Encore used to produce a few pidan also uh, more for, for tourists, uh, high-end tourist use. But it's, it's, it's a practice that's been lost and women in um, you know, villages have stopped uh, doing that mostly uh, uh, as an individual uh, practice. Okay, great. Um, so um, we now have a, a there's a, so on the um, there's a questions on the records also about how or why did they were these did these records survive? Um, um, wondering whether because. Um, you know, wonder why if nobody thought the records were really important, how did they manage to survive? And I presume that means through the Khmer Rouge period. Yeah, I really think that, I mean, bluntly said, I think no one thought they were important. Uh, I think interestingly, the museum, though there were tremendous effort in when the museum shut down to protect some pieces, have some pieces from other museums come back to the museum, not textiles, I mean like uh, sculptures and statues uh, being held back at the National Museum to protect them during the, the conflict. Uh, it seems interesting in a way that the Khmer Rouge uh, did not really care that much about this place, at least for the those four years. And so they left things as is. They were just left uh, without any, you know, concerns. Uh, I had a conversation about that, about those records with uh, Mrs. Lim, who um, was uh, in charge of filing those uh, those. Uh, archives and she's uh, she's at the library, the National Library, the museum. She's I don't know how old she is. Uh, she's she's an older elderly lady and she's the almost the memory of this place. And yeah, she she was telling that that you know when she found them when the the museum reopened when she started reworking they were just left and nobody had bothered to look at them or to care about them. So I, I guess that's that's why they survived because they were not uh, important or didn't weren't considered important. Interesting. Um, okay, so let's see, question from Jenny. Many ICATs appeared on the market in Bangkok in the early 1990s after the reopening of Cambodia and still Morrison's Hansen took over um, 
19, around 1970, uh, sorry, 1997, it might be interesting to explore these textiles as they were a way of, for Cambodians to gain money in a difficult situation, which is, I think, something you were talking about yeah. um, earlier. Yeah, that's, I mean, thank you, Jenny. I think that's really one of the avenues I'm looking at, you know, potential uh, networks of, of trade and collections to see where they appeared and how. Uh, I was, I think, mentioning that to you, Eve, that there's um, a collection at Yale um, Gallery of, that was donated by um, Helen Jessup. And those are textiles that she collected in Indonesia in the 70s. So I'm interested in kind of seeing how, what, what were the networks to get access to those objects in a period where nobody would get them directly from Cambodia. So there might be some interesting ways. I might never have exactly the tracing of those National Museum objects, but it can open some thoughts and ideas about uh, um, networks and uh, avenues for those, for sure. I think uh, Chu Meng Sung, uh, oh, so it was Champo Chorbap, I think the question uh, to go back to before. But yes, well, Sapo Chorbap, they're not that common. I mean, uh, but there's some, there's a workshop uh, and an enterprise called uh, Golden Silk Piek uh, near Siem Reap. And they also do uh, some pochorba. They're one of the few places um, uh, and they have that that knowledge and they create those really beautiful ones, uh, you know. Um, and so that's a good place in Siem Reap, um, near Siem Reap, not too far from IKTT, but another workshop, Golden Silk uh, Piek. They do those, but they're, it's, I think, probably the only ones um, around in Cambodia to really spend the time to create those very luxurious three dimensional uh, brocaded textiles. Yeah. Great. So this is going to be our last time. So if we could just answer this one quickly, it's a question about how do we know whether a textile is um, really an antique or a reproduction created in later years? Um, and, and, and how are they, they dated? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think one of the, the, the dating tool is to look at the, the dyes, obviously. I think early, early pieces from the 20th century were more, more often uh, made of natural dyes, even though chemical dyes already existed. Uh, but the chemical dyes are used today. Um, they're, you know, sometimes fast dyes coming from Thailand or, you know, sometimes also ec more ec ecological dyes, but less so less commonly so. So you can really see, I think, the difference in, in that. Uh, and then um, the other way is also looking at the, at the type of silk, uh, if you, uh, what kind of silk it is. Is, is it uh, machine-made industrial silk? And then this is something that is more recent, more recently uh, produced or some uh, artisanally uh, spun silk um, and real silk that will also give information about that. And then, um, yeah, methods to use those texts. I mean, that's more like a, con convers a conservation question, but uh, it's also just being able to trace the, uh, uh, the acquisition history also and the history of those pieces and where and by who they were collected and where. I think that also helps to do that. In terms of designs also, there's been some changes within the year from the pieces in 1900s to today, they don't look the same. So necessarily, because some of the motifs were so complex that nobody um, really do them now in some ways. Yeah. More questions. Oh. <laughs> no, that that's absolutely fabulous. What a fascinating, uh, what a fascinating presentation. And it's so it's your work is 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 really very, very interesting. I'm not a textile person only, but I feel like I've learned a lot through this. And um, I'm really looking forward to um, hearing more about your work as it progresses and and as you also open up the S21 um, portion Chapter, of the yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, that'll be very exciting. So thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this webinar this morning, evening, or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, this is an ongoing series, a monthly series. So we hope you join us next time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me, Even Thank you, everyone. And yes. thank you for your good questions. And reach out to me if you need, uh, uh, if you have any suggestions or thoughts, so I'm happy to share with you guys. Thank you.